Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire and guide you to take action to be all you can be. Today, my guest is Pip Brennan. Born and bred in Perth, Pip studied arts at UWA and started life working in museums, both in Perth and London. Then, after some time teaching English in Greece, she returned to Perth to begin her journey focused on ensuring there is a citizen and community voice in the deployment of public services, particularly health and victim services. In her time, Pip has been an advocate working in the Health Consumers Council, conciliator of health complaints at the government complaints body, and a leader of two health NGOs. She is now Executive Director of the Health Consumers Council in WA. But this is not all. At weekends, Pip writes. Her first book, Not My Story, is a memoir about a home invasion, assault, recovery, parenting, and a love affair. Pip, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bryn. So one of the first questions I always ask people is um, about how they've come or their experience of uh, being and living in WA. So can you tell us a bit about growing up here in Western Australia? Yeah, it's interesting because, I, you know, I'm an avid listener of the Dewey Award <laughs> podcast. So um, it's interesting listening to other people's experiences. So for me, born in the 60s in Perth, um, I mean, I remember the black swan at the airport, for example, that Marek was talking about. <laughs> yeah. But also for me, um, you know, I was, we were always a bit different. We lived in Scarborough, lots of surfies. We sat inside and read Jane Austen. We were, I guess, quite Anglophile kids. We were raised in a, you know, we were sort of always a bit, you know, arty farty, I suppose. When I was 14, I was lucky enough to go to Europe with my parents. And I liken the experience going to the moon and looking at the earth and suddenly seeing everything in the perspective, you know, in a totally different perspective from, from when you're actually raised um, in a particular place. As it, Between that age of about 14 through to when I moved to Europe at 25, I had a, a massive longing to move back to Europe. It was just a matter of when. So I made the decision that I would, instead of going and doing the, you know, when you're 18, going over there and, you know, working in a pub or whatever, I wanted to try having a professional career over there. So I actually did right. my degree first and then I went to Europe. But all that period of time from 18 through to 25, I always had in my mind that my home was Europe. That was, that was my destination was Europe. That's where I wanted to go. So it was very interesting. I didn't really have um, a great appreciation for Perth at, at that period of time in my life. So having the, had the opportunity to go to Europe, I'm going, this is amazing, you know, I love it. Yeah. And then interestingly, if you, you know, so I did the whole 10 years in Europe and I actually, the reason that I actually came home pregnant and that yeah. was what helped me make that final transition. Mm. So now, of course, my daughter's 19 <laughs> now and I, love it here and um, whilst I I always hanker for Europe my ideal world would be to spend the Australian winter in Europe that's that's my dream yeah and I, I miss the UK I think I will always miss the UK and you know Italy I've got a bit of a thing for Italy and Greece too my daughter's actually half Greek um, I it would break my heart to not be in Perth now so there's been a very slow warming up. When I first got back, I was still sneered a bit about Perth, oh, it's a small town and all that sort of stuff. But over time, I've just grown more and more and more to love it. And I, I think that's no coincidence that I've been able to um, understand a lot more about Aboriginal people in West Australia. And I've been able to, like before I moved away, we never did things like Welcome to Countries at the beginning of events. And I always yeah. remember the first time when I came back from Europe and I attended an event, there's one I just wanted to cry. It's the most gracious thing for an Aboriginal person to stand at the front and say, you're welcome, even though we took it anyway. So mm. so for me, I think there's been, you know, I, I feel I feel not just Australian, but I feel West Australian. Mm. What does that mean then? <laughs> I think, I suppose I work in the health sector and really and truly, you know, you, you go to meetings with your Victorian counterparts, we'll talk about, you know, remote delivering services in remote and you kind of look at them and go, really? <laughs> what do you know about remote? Really? <laughs> you know, we have such a, such a vast state and it is so, it's different, you know, like we don't have a lot of big towns all the way up, you know, it's sort of saying Queensland, for example, mm. is a lot of big towns. We are, we have a massive, massive um, amount of land. Mm. So I guess, you know, I feel that we're different and I feel we always get left out and, and that sometimes that's fantastic because we can just go off and do awesome stuff. Well, no one's looking. Mm. Cam we're too far away from camera for them to stop us. <laughs> I think the stats I like to um, put past my friends, particularly when I'm conversing with them from back in England, is that Western Australia itself is 11 times the size of the UK. 
uh, instead of a population of 65 million, we've got a population of, was it like 2.3 million? And something like 1.8 of those million all live here in the metropolitan area of Perth. Mm. So then we have that half a million that's scattered out in amongst those 11 new cases. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's interesting too. I just wanted to reflect that, you know, whilst I was an Anglophile and I got to live in the UK for a long time and all that sort of thing, I always remember that sense of going out into the middle of the country of the UK and you're never that far from the motorway. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can always feel that, you know, that the land feels like it's been tilled and tilled and tilled and tilled and tilled forever. It doesn't have that same feeling that the land, um, when we we're young, we lived in Kalgoorlie, we used to go out to the bush a lot, you know, and that, that it's, it's incredibly potent out there. I'd never forgotten that feeling. I never really had a feeling like that in Europe, mm. except sometimes when you went into the right kind of church and it had that feeling different but but along the same lines but there was something incredibly spiritual about this land so it took took me a long time to to appreciate it and grow back into it but but yeah that's how I feel now it's a fabulous place nobody lives like we do as my dad used to stay in, say in the 70s he was right he's nobody, right nobody lives like we do it's a bit like the alchemist journey isn't it yes you're sitting on the gold you yes. have to go on a journey away yep. from it to learn the fact that you are sitting on the gold. Yeah, I remember, like, my parents still live in the house I was raised in in Scarborough. Awesome. They're 92 and 91. They've got all their marbles and they, you know, look after themselves and so forth. So I, I took my, when I first came back and I took my young daughter down to Butler's Oval, where I used to go when I was young, and I was just standing in this beautiful spongy grass and the sun was coming up and there was, you know, birds and, and I was just thinking, I just said to my dad, how could I not appreciate this when I was young? I just thought this was the most boring place in the world and he said well you know you can't put an old head on young shoulders <laughs> <laughs> that's cold that's cold so there is um in the work that you do there's a strong theme of ensuring that the citizens and, and the community have a voice in like the, the machinations of, of administration um where does that come from in your journey it was really interesting when i heard the um heard your introduction because you know it's absolutely that is exactly right but it certainly wasn't how i started yeah. in a conscious way how it all started for me was becoming pregnant and what i found really concerning was that um and it hasn't really unfortunately changed much in 19 years what i found concerning was was there isn't a strong focus on evidence-based care or in women and family centered practice. It's based around what do those two things mean? So so if you if you want to look at, you know, you hope things are, are evidence based so that you know that if the evidence says this model of care provides better outcomes and that's the one we'll go for. That's yep. your hope, isn't it? It's a simple, simple kind of an idea. But um, the evidence based care, the evidence based model that's that's the best is midwifery led care for women at all, no matter whether they're mm. complex or not. But what we get here is you get a conversation with your GP. You know, okay, you're pregnant, yay. Um, do you have private health insurance and which obstetrician would you like? That is the conversation. And it really hasn't shifted much. It's based on a business and cultural model. And women are not at the centre of it and babies are not at the centre of it. So who's at the centre of it? It centres on doctors mm -hmm. and it centres on business models and the system. Right. And and I know I know that that's a bit of a contentious thing to say. I'm not trying to say that there aren't caring obstetricians because obviously there are, and there there's incredibly caring midwives out there. But the whole system is designed on the system. So that's again, sorry. So so when you think about the healthcare, it's not it's not actually that the patients at the centre, the systems at the centre. Right. Because it's a complex and difficult thing to pull off trying to run a health system. It's complicated and it's just it's just human nature that just ends up being, well, this is a lot easier if we do this here. It's easy for the system, but it's not easy for the person that this service is supposed to support. Right. If you see what I mean. So I first discovered this yeah. in maternity, which is what happens. Usually people don't get activated around health unless they have a healthcare episode. Yeah. Why would you? <laughs> exactly. Why would you? So for, as a young, healthy person, you know, maternity will often be your first um, real interaction with it. And for me, what I really wanted was to, I just wanted to go into labour spontaneously rather than be induced, if possible, as long as, you know, everything was going well with my baby. And I wanted to have a go at not using um, drugs for pain relief because I, I just wanted, if possible, for, for to have a drug-free delivery. 
Um, and I wanted to use water because it works super well for pain relief. And, um, you know, I did a lot of yoga and movement and so forth. That was what I wanted. And I actually pulled it off in 1998. And that was a good 10 years before we had a water birth policy here. We do have a water birth policy now. So you can labour in water in the public system anyway. However, it's still quite hard. It's very, very slow. It's very, very slow. And it's completely cultural. In different states, water birth will be a bit more normal. So I think it's, that's the sort of thing people think, oh, this is how it is. Well, it might be how it is in this health service, but it's not the absolute truth. So I guess for me, it started this whole journey on, you know, well, why can't we do things that have the people at the centre? Mm. Why can't we design systems that actually, you know, that actually look after the people that they're supposed to look after? And, you know, um, I, I probably didn't think about it in exactly those terms in that way. I, I thought of it much more concretely in terms of maternity. You know, how can we keep the, the woman, the baby, the family at the centre? And, you know, thing, you know, things move on, I guess. Um, you know, as we find that people that have worked in that birthing space, women are interested while they're having babies and then they move on, which is completely understandable. And there's a few of us that still go, we want to have, you know, empowered birth choices for women. Um so, I mean, for, at, right at the moment, we're doing a national strategic approach to maternity services. It's happening. It's a completely bureaucratic process and doing as much as it can to make sure that women don't have much say. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm. It's incredible. You it know, is. Lis- listening to that, how you may, as a woman who's pregnant, have this idea of how you want your birth to transpire. Yes. I mean, the yeah. idea of giving birth in water, you know, with a naturally occurring labour. Well, that's that's what, we, what, what women have been doing yeah. for, for years and years, and yet that sovereignty over, you, over your body has been taken away. Look, it has, and it becomes complex because there is another life at stake. Um, and I think people talk about, you know, your experience in a health service, it really is about how your expectations meet reality. And I think, you know, that is the thing. People actually, actually don't really know what they don't know and they probably don't have that many expectations. Mm. And one of their expectations is that you've got my best interests at heart. And the thing is that a system has a lot of things that they've got to keep at their own heart, which is, you know, have they got enough staff on that shift? Uh, are, are their obstetricians happy or are they going to leave? Um, you know, will we get sued? Will we end up on the front page of the West for all the wrong reasons? These are the sorts of things, you know, can we – Well. The, Big one too is can we balance the budget? Yes, that is their concerns. It is not you and your baby. Mm. And I guess for me, it's like it's managing know, risks. Of course, it's managing it? risks. Yeah, it's managing risks. So, and this is what I find interesting because once you manage risk, then you're focusing on the negatives. That's and, exactly right. And what will go wrong? And what will go wrong? What will go wrong? And so, well-being is not at the centre of Mm-mm. that. No, it's not. And I think this is the other thing. If you think about the stakes, you are never, ever going to forget the day your baby is born ever you're never going to forget it the staff they'll go home at the end of the shift and they'll never think about it again necessarily so who should get the biggest say (laughs) you know what I mean this is this is a thing for me but I guess also my point about the expectations is I I actually shared a flat with my sister in the 80s in Leaderville while she was studying nursing and then midwifery so I became fluent in medical terminology by osmosis Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, it's a language I've never lost. And I, I, I do love working in health. It's endlessly fascinating. Uh, we all have a body and we're all, we're all born and we all die. And so people who actually spend their time trying to learn how to support people in that are usually really interesting people. And it's full of drama. Health is full of drama. So um, I knew that when I went in, especially, you know, well, I got them to, you know, say yes for me to bring a birthing pool in and all that sort of stuff, you know, I knew that when I went into the hospital in labour, that they would try and make sure that they would manage the risk and they would they would say they would be timing me, I'd be under their clocks right away, and that they would, you know, pull a dead baby card, do you want your baby to die sort of thing so that you'll do what they want so that they can feel safe. I knew all of that would happen and I was ready for it. If you're not ready for that, how do you manage that? And so, it's, so again, I guess that expectation and experience. So what, you know... I also want to acknowledge that birth is a force of nature and things go wrong all the time and graveyards are full of mothers who died with their babies. And, yes, we've been doing it forever and women have been dying forever. I'm not (laughs) trying to say let's not do interventions. Not at all. Not at all. What I'm saying is can we not do evidence-based care? 
And can we not do it with a bit of kindness? So that's sort of how my journey started. And uh, that's, I, I thought, you know, very much along those lines of pregnancy and um, parenting. And then, of course, when my daughter was three, I survived a home invasion. And I start going through the victim support and the sexual assault services and you go, this is pretty crap actually. But again, you similar, don't think about it similar experience. until you have an experience and you yeah. go, oh, this could be better, this could be better. And that's sort of how some people think. I'm one of those people that wants something good to come out of something bad and I get a lot of healing and a lot of growth from being part of change. So committees, I'll happily sit on them. I, mean, I know not many people will say that, but that is true. You know, the change is a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of commitment. So, you know, for me, um, I just thought, oh, let's, let's do things differently. And that's when, I mean, nobody talked about it at the time, but I wanted to co-design a whole new way of doing things. We didn't use the word co-design then. Mm. And so a group of us um, survivors, we got together and we got some funding and we had a sort of forum. Sorry, these are survivors from? Sexual assault specifically, yeah. yeah. So we got got ourselves together and we we really wanted to do something. What, what we really wanted to do is we'd love to have something like a one-stop shop. That's actually a little bit expensive. So what about if we looked at individual advocacy instead? Because advocacy can, can really sort of it ties up a lot of those gaps between the systems. Every service will have a little bit of a gap and then the next service will pick it up. You know, it'll take you right to this edge, this will take you to that edge, but what's in the middle? And advocacy is a really good way to sort of stitch it all together, like the, I guess, like the stitching in a patchwork, if you will. And um, so that's what we thought would be great. We did a lit search. We had a forum. We got all the people from justice and victim services and sexual assault services. They all came along and they said, what a great idea. Just but, all off your own backs. Yeah. Just all off our own backs, yeah. And the, the thousands of thousands of hours of volunteer work, thousands. Mm. I mean, one wouldn't want to count. But, you know, like it's all led to paid work too for me in a sense, I yep. suppose, you know. Anyway, so when it came time to launch the service, they didn't refer and it didn't work, and we only got one year's funding, and it stopped. And I look back; that's all. That's all on the book, you know, because I got to I got to a certain stage of the book and thought, yeah, the change is not going to happen. Just finish the book, <laughs> just put a line under the book and move on, you know. And and it's been it's a really interesting book in terms of, you know, an examination of a co-design process that failed because the services certainly did not want a victim telling them what to do. They just didn't didn't want it. And they still don't really like co-design. People talk about co-design, but the, the co-design hard, means co designing something designing with both together. sides yeah, of the caregiver exactly right. and the care receiver. That's exactly right. Because I see it mm. that particular thing, the caregiver and the care receiver. I call it a three-legged race because it is. We're in this together. You must take the system's needs into account. It's important, but you must take the patient's need into account. What happens is the dial ends up at the service end because that's where all the power and money is in a way, you know, and that's where the people are every single day. Patients will move in and out of the system, but the staff are there day in, day out. That's their lives. Anyway, so um, what, what, what's at the core of co-design is, is who gets to decide. Who gets to decide? So if the service is the one that decides, it's not co-design. It's consultation, and there's nothing wrong with that, but just don't call it co-design. Yeah, <laughs> don't call it what it's not. <laughs> yeah, so it's sort of a term that's quite very much colonised. You'll see it littered all through government documents. <laughs> mm. Mm. So in, in your role as um, Executive Director of the Health Consumers Council, what, what does the Health Consumers Council actually do? So we do a couple of things. Mm. We do individual advocacy. So we actually, it's its exactly what I was hoping to achieve in the sexual assault um, um, sector. And, in fact, I had done a bit of work there as an advocate around about that time before I actually set up the advocacy service. Thought, this is a great model. Mm. This would work really well. Because it's very much, it's, it's transactional in that we say, okay, what are you needing help with right now? So just those stitches between the parts of the patchwork will help you with that bit. And then, you know, come back to us if you need anything. Rather than a case management where you're sort of constantly, you know, ringing and checking in, all that takes a lot more resources. Whereas if you just open door, we're here if you need, this is, yeah. we can help you from this bit to this bit and then let us know how you go sort of thing. Anyway, so um, we do that. Um, we also do, the other thing is consumer and community engagement. So that's where we're really trying to build a, a um, 
culture of so when you say consumer here you're talking about we're talking about health consumer see it's it's one of those things it's a term in the sector i'm not crazy about it but instead of patients we say consumers right because it covers people who might not see themselves as patients or might be you know accessing a physio you know in a in a community clinic Mm -hmm. you know or might be going having a massage or you know something like that so all of them are people that consume health services and I, i think it's trying to you know, trying trying to reference the fact that consumers have rights. You know, mm. a bit more active perhaps than a patient who's very patient sitting in those waiting rooms for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you actually feel with what you're doing, you are making a change? Or? Well, that's a really good question. Certainly in the early days, I can remember in about 2006 when the policies around maternity were being rejuged in WA and I remember having these amazing conversations, you know, that were around things like water birth. I thought, oh, I never thought we'd have these conversations. This is amazing. These fantastic models of care and policies that just said the most fabulous things. But the reality is, is, is that um, that's like a diet plan. It's not lost weight. So the step between drawing up a diet plan and losing weight, the implementation, that is a bit that is usually neglected. We spend a lot of time on a beautiful diet plan. Yep. An inquiry, for example, full of recommendations, diet plan. If you actually want to lose weight, it's you really need to put a lot of time and energy and effort into implementation because that's the hard bit, as we know. As we all know, but but it's you much easier to create a document down and make a plan, and yeah. it just magicked its way into life. Life would be really easy. I know, <laughs> I know, and it's not that the plan's not important, but I actually try and spend less and less time on that because I, I think I think government um, and NGOs and a range of other really you know really caring people put time in and they do something that looks really good. I think it always says exactly what it should say. What I try and spend our you know, slim resources on is what can we do to help it be implemented? Mm. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. When I was doing research to go for the interview of the executive director role, which was about nearly four years ago, it was just after I'd self-published um, Not My Story, uh, I found this website and it was called patientopinion.org.au. So, I hope listeners, please take note. Anyway, so I saw this website and it's just a fantastic platform which is moderated where people can write their stories about their health experience Mm -hmm. and it's got a what we call hashtag bias for action it has a thing where where it actually it it just tracks has this so the story's been told and then there's another one for the story's been listened to there's another little button for stories been responded to and the final magic button change made so that's on the assumption that a change needs to be made. More than half the stories are positive mm-hmm. and, you know, 5% will be quite critical and the other 45 will be a bit of a mix of both and, you know, perhaps change is needed, perhaps it isn't. But what it offers is it offers health services this opportunity for a open conversation about quality and safety in their health service. So even if it's a bit of a stinky, critical story, you can really see those turn around when people go, well, actually, we never really thought about that. We're going to go off and have a team meeting. And they go off in the team meeting and they go, we had the team meeting. This is what we're going to do. What do you reckon? I mean, how awesome is that? Mm. How awesome is that? So um, the current Minister for Health, um, he um, implemented that website across Western Australian Public Health Services. So all public health services are what you call subscribers. So whilst the website's open for everybody across the whole of Australia right now, you need to have the services subscribed so they're getting the notifications and they can they can set it all up so they can do their bit, they can pull all their reports off that they need at the other end as well. Mm. So this is a fantastic culture change tool and um, I really would encourage anybody who's had either any kind of a story that they feel they want to tell, positive or negative, to have a think about it because it really is shifting the culture. So I suppose I would call that a a successful systemic advocacy initiative of our agency. Mm. Mm. That's one thing. Mm. There's a lot more. I mean, this year, for example, in April, we run um, Patient Experience Week events. So it's based on, um, it's an American thing, so it's on Anzac Day Week, so it really doesn't work very well in Australia. But, hey, you know, just let's all be solidarity Patient Experience Week. So it's the last week in April, and it really tries to focus on the efforts people are making to, to you know, sort of show up to work 
and maintain compassion. It's actually extremely hard to maintain compassion in the system that people are working under. They're often got crushing workloads, so much reporting. They've got so many things that pull them out of that being able to be there in the now and being able to make a decision and being able to use their initiative and their intelligence and their skills. A lot of that stuff is blocked for them. Mm. So, so patient experience work really tries to highlight, you know, the importance of, you know, connecting to those simple things like instead of asking what's the matter, with a patient, you ask, what matters to you? Because what matters mm. to the patient is something only they will know that. Mm. It doesn't matter how many clinical degrees you've got. You can't answer that question. Only the patient can answer that. It's that whole idea of the expertise at both ends of the stethoscope. They won't know what's going on in their body. You understand the clinical parameters. So anyway, it, it, even just turning that around, you can start to say, well, okay, what, what's really important to me is to get home and watch Netflix. Well, you know, you might not need the same sort of intervention as somebody who goes, well, actually, I'd like to keep on swimming to rottenness solo. You know, you've got different different health outcomes you're chasing. So you can plan the care around what matters to the patient. I mean, just And the other really simple thing like, um, hello, my name is. So I don't know if you're aware of that initiative, but there was a, a clinician in the UK and she had a, um, terminal diagnosis and like many people they get on the other side of the fence and they go holy jamali i didn't realize how awful this was yes. <laughs> um nobody says hello nobody says what their name is they just start doing things to you they don't even say hello so just that simple thing if you look at someone and say hello my name is you're already connecting with them as a human being and it, and it shifts a little bit how you actually interact so sort of just highlighting those kind of um, initiatives. And this year we did a mini gathering of kindness, which is a movement that started in Victoria um, with health service providers really trying to bring kindness back into healthcare. Because I think that's most of the stuff we read that's negative is communication, but underneath it too is kindness. Mm. Mm. It's fascinating to listen to you and, and reflecting on this because you can see how there's – People at their most weakest point. Correct. Um, when they probably need that big outreach of humanity and kindness and compassion and connection. And, and yet they come up against this machine. That's right. And, and people take on parts of that machine. And within that machine, um, whether it be health provision or victim support or, it's or even, same. or even, yeah. you know, child support or some, something like that. You, you, you come across this machine and the machine doesn't necessarily have empathy. Mm. And, and it's this almighty clash. There is. And, and the individual staff have empathy. Mm. It's, it's just that they're sitting within us in a system. You it's know. not necessarily encouraging and rewarding that. No, it mm. isn't. And sometimes it might be downright um, toxic and bullying and ghastly. Yes. Yeah. So because you have all difficult. sorts of. All sorts of stuff on. going on. Yeah. Mm. It is very hard to deliver a service 24 7, 365. It's, I guess, mm. you know, from my time um, being a business consultant and looking at things through the, uh, the lens of an you know, organizational psychology master's degree, you, you, I find it interesting when um, heads of an organization sort of come back and say, well, people are not doing what I thought they would do. Uh, well, what, are you, what are they doing? And it might be, well, they're actually doing um, X, Y, and Z instead of A, B, and C. And then you look at actually what are the measures that are in place? What are the rewards that are in place? What is what is being encouraged and reinforced and what is not? And then after a while, you suddenly realize that X, Y, and Z is totally natural because the whole system is set up to, to deliver that, not mm. A, B, C. Mm. And so, yeah, but then, but then in the objective world of, of you know, we need to have stats and budgets and 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 things like that. Um, how do you measure kindness? Mm. How do you measure compassion? Mm. How do you measure? Uh, and yet, you know, the patient opinion tool does does do some work towards yes. that. You know, you can and and we are, and it's just a matter of spreading that out a little bit mm. more. And I guess for me, um, I mean, I've sat I've sat on many different committees and I've spent many, many hours and all sorts of things where I'll be the only person in the room who's not clinical. And I'm used to that. I mean, I can speak fluent health, so it's okay. And I mm. usually understand what they're talking about because I'm such a nerd. And I always have my iPad with me if the um, acronym is, is, you know, stumps me. Or I'm quite happy to just ask, so I don't know what that means because that just wakes people like, oh, hang on a minute, yet we're all completely, you know, fully immersed in our in our own world. Having one person who's non-clinical will change the conversation. And I think 
which is great, but mm. also if you get back to that concept of the three-legged race. <laughs> yes. So the person, say, for example, is putting a catheter in and the person is receiving it, they're both having an experience, but it's an entirely different one. And there are needs around that. There are needs for that health practitioner to feel that they are competent and comfortable doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you know, there's also the needs, of course, for the person to not hopefully be too traumatised. And there's, you know, there's things you can do like say, hello, my name is, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this because um, if you've got any questions, you know, let me know. Um, you know, visibly washing your hands before you do anything <laughs> always makes people feel better <laughs> and responding well if they ask you to wash their hands because that's something that hand yeah. hygiene is a massive thing. So so if you're planning the whole of the services, only taking the service provider into account, which is how most things are still done, you're going to end up with not the right end product. It's, it's yep. not rocket science. It's just that engaging is complex and time-consuming um, and ultimately, I would say, rewarding. It, it's a bit like the idea of prevention. If you really have some good consumer input while you're planning something, you're going to end up with a better service, less waste, all that sort of thing. Mm. But it's about trying to get that commitment up front when people are pushed and, you know, don't have time and then looking at the budgets and, you know, all that sort of thing. Yes. Mm. Yes. And um, the, the thing that sort of springs to mind for me is it, this focus, the difference in focus is that I, I remember an example of, I think it was Scandinavian Airlines, and, and their, their chief exec made a very subtle change in the culture. He noticed that what they were focused on was flying planes mm. and all he did was change it to moving passengers mm. and then everything changed. That's exactly right. And yes, mm. yes. How do you stay motivated in the middle of this? Um, what's interesting, when you were talking earlier about change, one of the really exciting things that we've done this year is um, tuned in to School for Change Agents. I don't know if you ever heard of School for Change Agents. It's based in the UK, this um, organisation called NHS Edge, so mm. it's sort of like a subsidiary, if you will, of the NHS, yeah. the National Health Service. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's, a, it's, a, it's really designed more for service providers um, but, you know, consumers like myself, get a, I got a lot out of watching it. So it's the sort of thing that keeps you motivated and it shows you it shows you exactly that kind of list of, you know, why don't things, why is it only, say, 30% of change management processes actually change anything? Mm. And there's a range of different things. And one of the first things is when do you share the problem? Do you share the problem with, say, a consumer after you've thought the whole problem through, come up with a solution, and then you say, do you like solution A or solution B? Or do you come to a consumer and say, this is a problem, let's talk? Mm. And then you co-design, there's that word again, a yes. solution. Not consult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, that, that then will address things that you, you won't be able to get with A or B. So that, that exactly the same thing happens internally, of course, you know, because staff are trying to make changes internally mm. and they will come up with a solution and they'll go and tell their colleagues, we're going to do this now. But the colleagues go, oh, well, I'm going to do this now because they didn't get a chance to come up with a solution. It's just human nature. It, it's also human nature to try and problem solve, you know, to, to not share the problem until you've got a solution. Mm. But it's like many of these things, if you turn it on your head and do something that feels really uncomfortable, like writing with your left hand if you're right-handed, you'll actually get a really different result. I think you're right because it's our human nature to sort it of is. squirrel away with a problem and, you know, I need to come up with the answer. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to sitting there in a state of unknowing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so and <clears throat> I wouldn't like to think that um, I'm putting myself forward as this, you know, I never do anything wrong with engagement. <laughs> Everything I do is terrific. Like all people, yeah. when you engage, it's humans. You work with humans. You make mistakes. They make mistakes, you know, have interactions that don't go well. And it's all about just, just continuing to go, okay, let's, let's keep thinking about what's the vision? What's the vision we're all working for? Everybody's got a vision that's big enough for us all to come together. How do you keep on working towards that? And over and over and over and over again, you hear that it is a marathon, not a sprint. And you have to accept that you're in for the long haul. There are some global shifts that can, can happen quite quickly, but usually it's, you're in for the long haul. Mm. Mm. Because you said change take can take time. It does, and and so if you're talking you, about something so big. That's right. And if you think about the marathon, think about how marathon people they have times off. You've got to have times where you just go, yeah, I'm not doing that for a while. That's just too hard. I mean, certainly with um, stuff around sexual assault, after I thought, no, this is not this is not good for me anymore. I'm just going to move on out. But 
it's always over there in the corner. Whenever I get a chance, you know, I I still mm. do what influencing I can. And and I have a feeling it's coming. I, f- I feel all of these things come around again. And when the time is right, you can have another go. Hmm. Do you ever get days where you're like, oh? Yeah, I do. I do. I had one earlier this year. I was really hoping to. Um, I was really hoping to see if we could get a citizens jury going. Um, so that concept of that, that's 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 something that has to be done at government level. So it could be. What's a citizens jury? So so imagine imagine you've got a question. Imagine as a politician, you've got a choice to make. Either way, is profoundly unpopular. Mm. You know, you can't win. You just cannot win. So the opportunity is is to to do to run something like a citizens jury where um, one of the key things is that you have demographic uh, demographic representation um, so you will have something that really reflects the population now the difficult thing of the committees that I've been sitting on most of us around the table are white middle class and well educated we do not reflect the population mm. there are many um, many creative ways that you can bring that voice in because that voice is really important and you know it's, it's there you just got to try a little bit harder and do things a bit more creatively but with a citizens jury that's that's the starting point is it has to be demographically representative and that in itself is a kind of a massive process so once you've got that group of people and look at say for example in um south australia they did one around nuclear power and i think they had 300 people Mm -hmm. um some of them in local government ones might have 100 or 40 like it just depends you know it depends on what it is so there's no absolute hard and fast rules but so basically you get this jury um of people who may know nothing about it at all they could be a nerd like me that knows heaps about health or they could do nothing at all doesn't matter they've just got a you know, fit that demographic profile. Then you have kind of a jury type situation in that they get to hear evidence from experts. So um, imagine you've got, say, say about six days of hearings. Um, and so you'd have um, a little bit of a gap in between. Mm. But obviously, with pre reading, it's a big commitment. So pre reading, but also when you come along, there'd be certain speakers that they go, Well, you do need to know this because you don't know what you don't know in the beginning. Yeah. But then you've got a chance to say, Look, we need to hear more from that person and a bit more from that person. We want to find out a bit more about that. So anyway, you've got this opportunity to really start to get some good, solid background information. So you really get to grips with this, with the, um, with the issue. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's usually a question, say a question that I was thinking would be really interesting to pose for West Australians is how can we afford the health system we want? Because there are difficult decisions to be made, you know, and so, so how, do, how about if we pull together our resources to think about that question? So there would be a range of different sub workshops because there's lots of different parts to that puzzle so there'd be people who'd actually work on that same sort of working group as one of the jury members across the whole of the six days of deliberation um there usually there needs to be a pretty strong media coverage so that there's that transparency so that the everyone's aware that this is something that the public as in nobody who's they're people who are not elected yep they're not i mean they'll get they have to get paid a stipend you can't be away from your job that long without being paid a stipend but um you know they are people from the community they are not experts. They are people who, with all the same resources that all of us have. Hmm. Then at the end, they have a chance to present to the, the key minister for who they're answering the question. And, um, you know, you can go two ways. You can you can provide recommendations or you can provide this is the solution. And hmm. obviously it's a bit more attractive to have recommendations because then you can still retain that sort of control. But, you know, the opportunity is, is that what, what comes out at the end is something that the community trusts more. Yes. Because it hasn't been For all the reasons bureaucrats we or politicians that. making the decision. Yes. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty massive undertaking. So it's not something I – mean, yeah. I mean, it, again, it depends. I mean, I think that there's some really good stuff that can be done at, at um, local government level. But mm-hmm. the important thing is it can't just be a not-for-profit going, oh, we're going to go over here and do something. It has to be that two-legged race, that three-legged race again. You've got to have the government and the community working on it. Mm-hmm. So how did that influence – a well, time it didn't because this I, year when you were like, oh. yeah, I didn't, I didn't get my citizens jury, and um, and I just, I don't know, I thought I might, and I didn't, and um, it was just that thing of dusting off. There, there was, I've been offered some other opportunities to do something a little bit similar, still sort of, still really early stage. It's not related to that review. It's something else. Mm. So, so I, you know, I need to acknowledge that. But it was just, I had that. I was, it was sort of like trying to 
just perhaps through the force of my enthusiasm alone, try to force the idea along. Yes. And then, and then just to reach that point in the day when I realized it's just so not going to happen was, was, was really difficult. And I was actually doing the school for change agents and it was fantastic because it just talked about that whole thing about, you know, just give yourself some time and you dust yourself off and, and then you go, yep, no, that didn't happen, but this is happening. How did you bring yourself back from that? So that was really around, um, I actually, interestingly, I had an acute energetics treatment. <laughs> um, that was the first time I had one. I thought I need to do something. My energy felt quite stuck. So what I will often do, I, I think sometimes you can go into a whole mental thing, but the, you do need to have something else. I think I mentioned um, to you that yoga is something that I use a lot mm-hmm. uh, as a as a self nurture and Grounding keeping your energy and- in. You know, so I think I think you do need to go. Okay, I'm gonna need to I need to hunker down and self nurture. Mm. And also just to recognise that, you know, sometimes things don't happen and that's okay, you know, and it's not the end of the world and, you know, just keep going. And then, you know, I've in that particular case, I thought, well, you know, I've really raised awareness around citizens' juries and did some education. There seems to be a little bit of interest in West Australia. I mean, we did a lot of those in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, you know, it's sort of one of these things that comes around again, you know. So I just think, well, you know, that's what happened and move on. And that's, I guess, that that whole that marathon, not a sprint. You know, it yeah. wasn't this time. You know, I, I when I didn't, um, when I wasn't successful getting the advocacy service for survivors of sexual assault happening, I did actually feel I felt like quite a failure for quite a long time. Mm. And you know, it's sort of in yourself. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and and um, and I sort of put it in the book, thinking, oh well, you know, got to you know confess all my my failures and all that sort of thing. But you know, I guess I've done a lot more, um, you know, self development work around the importance of making mistakes. And the importance of, you know, fail early, fail often, just keep on going, keep on going. So, you know, I, I sort of see that now. I also think I was a bit ahead of my time. We weren't even talking about co-design back in mm. 2009. It wasn't even on the agenda, and it is now. So I just think it's one of those things that um, it is definitely how you frame it. Do you want to frame it as a failure or do you want to frame it as a, oh, that didn't work, so let's try something else. We have a lot to get the health care that we should have or deserve. What was your question, sorry? Are we, are we ever likely to end up with the health care? Look, I mean, life is never perfect, but I, I really like that model where, um, where it talks about, you know, what sits where, because there are plenty of things that sit in the community. I mean, what I think is fascinating is loneliness and social isolation provides a greater health risk than smoking, obesity, you name it. Yeah. That is not something the health system can fix. Mm. So there are many things that the community can do too. I think a lot of the time it's been a bit of that, you know, come along, we'll make you better. And that's just, you know, that's just the way we used to be a little bit. But I think we've got a great opportunity as a community, to step right up. You know, obviously our own health is really important, what we eat, how we exercise. That yeah. can totally influence, you know. I mean, hospital avoidance, that's got to be something we've all got to aim for, it's like isn't it? It's ancient Greek times when you, used to you, pay, you when you used to pay your doctor, you, you pay your doctor every month that you, you were, were well. healthy. Yeah. And if you weren't, then you didn't get paid. Yeah, I'd heard that in, in relation to traditional Chinese medicine specialists mm. and, and, you know, I can imagine that would... There, you know, say for example, with the Greeks, that's that's you know, you are what you eat is so important, and that simple, simple thing. We have a health mm. system and a food system that don't talk to each other. That yeah. alone. But the thing is, I guess what I, I guess what I feel quite optimistic about is, um, is if you, if you think about what's happening around, um, so let's say if somebody gets a really bad diagnosis. Um, and there'll be, the whole hospital go, well, we've got this brochure and we've got this social worker and we've got this counsellor and we've got this, that and the other. Mm, what, <laughs> what will help the person more than anything is finding the Facebook group with six other people going through exactly what they're going through. Yep. Nothing will help them more. And this is, you know, any, any disease you want to, want to think about, there'll be a Facebook group and there'll be a group of people doing incredible work to help each other. Hmm. This is the opportunity. I think there's, there's that whole, um, you know, we can eat the right things. We can do the right exercise. We can find the right support and, you know, we can go to hospital when we need. That's what it's there for, but it can't do everything. 
Mm. So I guess there's a bit of a waking up and a growing up that we, we all we're doing. all need. We're all doing. I think we are doing it. I mean, government's still a bit like, well, hang on, I still want to be dead. You know, and you're like, yeah. well, no, dad, you know, yeah. you're my brother now, you know. So there's a bit of that, you know, that sort of concept of co-design. Yes. Like, well, I don't want to let go of the power. You know, there is that. But that will shift too. It will. I just know it will. It just might not be in my work life. But, hey, mm. it's all, you know, we all benefit from things. I like that, considering... Done. The whole systemic part mm. of it. I did. I had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Richard Wally, and he was saying how they consider everybody around the watering hole. Mm. He also raised some very interesting points about when the early settlers came here. He says we we had was it sixty seventy thousand years of not needing government, not needing um, prisons, not needing hospitals, mm. not needing any of this, and then the West, with its infinite wisdom, decided that we did. That's pretty much it. You know, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm really interested, I know that I'm jumping topics a bit, but I am really interested in restorative justice. That's actually one of my passions. If we do want to save for society, that's something we need to think about a bit more. We have to stop doing the um, lock them up and throw away the key. That's not, it's clearly not helping us, costing us a lot of money. Mm. Um, and, and those restorative justice. Could justices, be going in the health service. Well, or, <laughs> you know, could be going in prevention, mm. you know. Health coaching, for example, health go. coaching can work really well. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I love Richard Wally. He's just the most glorious human being, isn't he? Um, and and you know, the, those principles around restorative justice, they are from they're from indigenous communities because they had to live with each other. We had to work out why. How are you going to live with each other? We just try and pretend we'll put people in prison; they'll never come back. Well, they all come back, pretty much. They all come. They all get let out. What are we doing about that? Nothing. So anyway, that's my other. I have quite a few soapboxes actually, which I quite happily. <laughs> so tell me about the writing then. Right. Now the writing. So um, I did an arts degree, Bachelor of Arts, majoring in literature, and I graduated all the way back in 1987. And um, I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. Um, it's, it's an interesting time of life. Computers were just a thing. So I ended up, because I had computer experience, because I worked in a bank, long, boring story, I got a job in a museum because they invested in this massive mainframe system they had no idea how to use. So, mm. you know, let in the intern and I'll tell them how to use this system yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. So um, despite all my fears about not getting a job, two weeks later I was working in the museum sector. But, you know, I, I guess really it was too um, tender and vulnerable, a, a wish to say, I want to write books. And when I did my arts degree, that was somewhat of a disappointment apart from the fabulous Dennis Haskell, who, you know, is still writing. He was still publishing poetry and teaching us, God knows how. He was the most inspiring tutor that I had, and he was also writing. There was, I don't know if you've ever looked at The Artist's Way stuff by Julia Cameron. It's pretty amazing, but she talks about the shadow artists when people are not creating anymore, and actually what they will do is they will tear down people who are trying to create. A lot of the tutors I thought yes. they were, were shadow artists, you know. So so it was really only Dennis that I felt like I really got something that really fed me. But um, for all sorts of reasons, I was just too chicken shit to write. There was, there's no other way to describe it. And um, interestingly, not that long after the assault, you know, obviously you think you've got a lot of things in your mind and all that. One of the first things that I went out, I was having lots and lots of healings or, or any sort of um, thing you can think of. I, I really believe that trauma gets locked in the body and the more you do in the body, the more you can heal. Yep. Um, and one of these beautiful ladies I've worked with for quite a few years in a volunteer capacity elsewhere, she said, you've got something to write about now, Pip, because she was she could always pick up on the stuff you were too tender to talk about, you know. And, and, it, and of course, it proved that I did end up writing. It took me 14 years, but I did eventually um, finish the memoir on surviving the home invasion and try, trying to create change. And um, I had that, I, I think a lot of it, your women listeners will, might get this, but as we get to 50, there's just this push of if not now, when? And so, you know, self-publishing was probably the best decision I ever made because you could just get it off the runway to say that's happening, that's done, you know. Mm. And it was sort of like handing in the biggest assignment ever. And um, I was actually just for that. Tell me about the process of that. Oh, it was, it was, it was interesting. Like it was sort of super easy. Like I had this um, really kind, um, she lives not far from here, this kind graphic designer say, well, I'll do your cover for you. Um, I 
I just I did I did pay a bit here and there for editing, but mm, I didn't really. I just kind mm. of, you know, I'm an English graduate. I can write, you know, and I had a few people provide feedback, but um, the actual process when I found the right people, these people down in the southwest of WA. And you know, I just can't remember what they're called now. But um, basically, it was it was I thought really um, relatively straightforward. You give them the word dog, and in fact, my sister and her husband I think um, just uh, formatted it so it looked nice. And mm. you just gave them that, and they just zhuzhed it up. And then I just remember that first day I looked on Amazon, it was there. It was just the most surreal experience ever. Because you can upload your own book onto Amazon. Well, I didn't. They, they did it for me, so I, I went. But essentially, through. you can. You can. I mean, it's and then self published. It's incredibly easy. Yeah. So, I mean, at the time, it was self publishing was still feeling a little bit, oh, well, there goes your writing career. Goodbye. And of course, now it's completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. It can be a good decision to publish or self publish. It depends. But for yeah. me personally, getting that done was terrific. It was it was such a good thing, and to in, get it in done. What way? So, um, as I say, the energy release from getting something finished. Mm. Um, I was actually working at the WA Council of Social Service at the time that I finished it, and they said let's do a launch, so I could do something that was really, you know, sector focused. And they had people from the Sexual Assault Resource Centre there. You know what I mean? Like it yes. was it was it was able to sort of do it as a almost like an industry book. Um, I did this incredible friends and family launch at um, a writing centre in Swanbourne. And it was just like, you know, the end of the, like the end of the session, the love around the heart. And you just think, well, I mean, I don't think I've probably got the right numbers when you look at book sales. <laughs> but, but the thing is that sort of, it just doesn't really matter in a way. Um, it's all about. I suppose if one person buys it and. Well, reads I mean, it, I've had then... a lot more than one people. Yeah, yeah. And, and I have, I have helped women. Yeah. You know, and which is fantastic. And I actually do do. It's probably a bit like a business card in a way now for the right people. People are trying to do stuff in the sector. I go, look, I've done some. You know, I did some stuff. You might want to read this chapter here because it sort of gives you a bit of a feel. And usually, I give it to people, and they go, oh, I just can put it down and read the whole thing. You know, one sitting. You know, so it's still something that I, you know, like once it's there, it's there. It cost me five bucks to get a copy, and you know, just it's great. How did you best thing ever? How did you fit it in writing? So at the moment I'm a weekend writer. I'm yeah. not doing on the mornings. I prioritise yoga. Yeah, yeah, and um, because some of my days will be twelve hour days. There's not really much at the end. I'm not a night person. Mm. Um, I do often wake up in the middle of the night, um, and I would say it's patchy. What I feel like at the moment, what I what I've set myself a goal, and I'm about two and a half years into that five year plan, is to get a book traditionally published and um, pay off the mortgage so that I have a completely different financial um, scope of what, what are my choices next mm -hmm. because um, ideally I would work less and write more mm -hmm. but it's it's just not the right time. Like at the time of, of um, publishing my book, I was going to become a coach. I was going to work for myself. Everything like that was all – I was going off on this other tangent um, and then this position at the Health Consumers Council came up and it was literally like this big light went on in my heart and I knew I have to go for this. I don't know whether I'll get it or not, but I have to go for this. So I was, mm. imagine I've got my ship of entrepreneurial ambitions sort of going on and then this was just like a T-boat, a torpedo, just went <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And it, I gave myself a hard time for a while about that. But, of course, in hindsight, what an incredible gift, you know, because there's certain things you can do in the not-for-profit sector that is hard to do from, from you know, things that I want to do that are a little harder to do from corporate or, or um, entrepreneurial, so mm. it's just yeah, it's it's where I need to be right now. So weekend writing is what I do. I have a lovely house husband, so I don't have to do any housework on the weekends, and I definitely don't write as much as I should. Right. <laughs> and what are you working on now? So now I've got myself a deadline of July, end of July. I want to have. Um, so I've been working on a manuscript for about two and a half years for my first novel. And um, I, the project is a fictionalised version of the memoir. And one of the reasons, that was a suggestion made to me by an agent. And I still remember the moment when he made that suggestion. I just went off in this whole visualising this whole thing <laughs> happening. And, um, and it seemed really radical. Oh, my God. And um, 
so I've been doing that for the last two and a half years. So I've got I've got a draft. Um, I've done a, quite a bit of online writing because I've found when you're working that much to have online writing is good. You've got those touch points. You've got to get stuff in. So I do have a full manuscript that needs editing. And so, you know, like writing is rewriting, as they say. So I'm in very much in the rewriting phase. Mm-hmm. And then I think once I get that lodged, I'm just using that as a deadline. Right, okay, manuscript competition, boom, get it in. But, I mean, I will try other places as well. Then I think I'll start thinking about what's the next project. You know, I think yeah, it's really good to to feel like you've got something off the runway to a degree. I mean, obviously, if you put something in and you get the prize, then you've still got to go through all the stuff. But it's a very different process from trying to write something from scratch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I'm just planning the next thirty years of my career off as a writer. Really, I'm just very, very early days starting. Mm. It's interesting to listen to you. And because it would be very easy, certainly listening to your job, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who, you know, go in, go into that, or almost refer to it as a mangle on Monday morning at eight o'clock, and then get spat out of it at about five o'clock, six o'clock Friday, and and having been through the mangle all week, there's there's not a lot left mm. for anything to do anything creative or anything that gives that might take you on a new direction. So it takes a lot of time and effort to even get that momentum I imagine. Yeah it does although you know to be fair I think I have a really interesting and creative job and I have mm. a lot of meaning in my day to day work which I think is a great blessing so I, I don't want to I don't want to diss my day job it's just it's just probably a few more hours than I like mm. but I just feel like at the moment that's bad luck I'm just I'm focusing on the mortgage and yep. I'm focusing on you know just seeing what can I do in the next you know say four years what can I do let's see what it will look like and then think again, you know, what happens next, you know. So, um, yeah, but on the weekends there are some times I think, yeah, I'm a little bit tired, I can't really do much. But, you know, you don't have to do a lot to stay in touch with the project. It's just trying to stay in touch. And when I get off track and I have lost touch, you just go back and you're back in touch before you know it. So next weekend's Margaret River's Writers Festival, so I'm going to spend some time just going down to my sister's house in Margaret River and she's got a fantastic writing place and, maybe go to one or two things just to get a bit of that exciting writer's juice. Mm. Mm. And was the was writing the book, the memoir, a sort of the end of the the process of getting over the um Oh look I was well and truly over it long before yeah. I got to the end. I <laughs> I was trying to see what happens to recommendations of inquiries because in two thousand and six, um so that was Four years for me after the assault. Um, in 2006, there was a statewide um, inquiry into the prosecution of assaults and sexual offences. So that was the first time I got involved in the inquiry, you know, I gave evidence and all that sort of stuff. And then I got invited to sit on a committee to oversee the implementation of the recommendations. Then we changed government, new government. We're like, oh, well, we don't really care about that. And anyway, I thought, well, I'll just see what happens. And then at the end of six years, I thought, yeah, not much. <laughs> Not much necessarily. Um, so, so that was a that was. It was probably more me letting go of creating change than me coming to a sense of okayness. I mean, I think there's all sorts of things, you know. Like I, I was 36. You know, I had a lot of support, you know, fantastic family support, and you know, I had a beautiful partner who I'd, I'd only met six months before, and I think all that that you know, masculine healing energy is also really important and I just think, you know, I had a lot of really great opportunities to do something good out of it. So, yeah, it wasn't so much about coming to the end of it because it's sort of, it's one of those things I suppose you you constantly reevaluate. I certainly remember times thinking I'm not the person that I was before this happened and then having this awful thing when I met people, I have to tell them otherwise they, they're going to, they're not going to know who I really am, you know, and they're going to like me and then they're going to find out and they're not going to like me. Like something bizarre like that. And that just fades. It's a bit irrelevant. And now it's sort of like, oh, I don't know if I've mentioned and they go, oh, my God. You know? So yeah. it's sort of I'm actually coming around to the other side where I think it's probably time for me to talk more about it publicly to the people because it wakes them up. They go, oh, not you. And you go, yep, yeah, we need to talk about this. So I remember, for example, um, the Sexual Assault Resource Centre had its 40th anniversary I think it was about 18 months ago and they asked me if I'd come and talk and look I had a speech planned and then in the morning I woke up I had this this poem come through it was not 
like a poem poem, but there's this thing that you, we were given during the um, group course, and it's, a, it's about imagine a woman, and it's a really interesting yeah. poem about imagining a woman, you know, who's, you know, safe and, you know, loves herself for who she is, all that sort of stuff. It's a really, it's a really important piece of work, I think. And I'd done this painting collage. I went to a collage phase for a while <laughs> around it, and I'd, and I'd chosen the poem because um, I'd found it in my old you know, when I was sort of cleaning something up, I found my old book from when I was going through the group program where you would actually debrief the assault. And um, that was a really good process. And so I, I cut up the poem, made it like all the bits of the poem were like petals, you know, around the edge. And um, I had this picture in the centre of this, you know, because we did lots of drawing of how you visualise yourself and there was this healed person in the centre with all these petals coming off the edge. Anyway, so when I woke up in the morning, I just knew I had to, Re, I just repurposed it. Imagine a sector. Imagine a sector that puts a woman at the centre. Mm. And it was very powerful. You know, I, I managed to pull it off, even though it was a health department <laughs> gathering. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, I probably need to do a bit more of that now. I think the time is right because I've sort of got to the point where most people don't know me like that. I do have a website if they want to look me up, they can mm. find it. But but most people just go, oh yeah, she runs a health consumers council. What have you learned about PIP on your journey? Um, yeah, it's a really interesting one. I think um, maybe it's just an age thing, but I, I think there's been a lot of times where I've questioned myself mm -hmm. and, you know, felt like I need to go on this journey and that journey and the other journey, and I sort of don't really need to. So I think in some ways... I mean, there was there was this moment in the in the actual event of the assault where I had this incredible calm. So there's, you know, what the sort of I mean, it's probably like a moment of enlightenment, I suppose. But you know, unlike Eckhart Tolle, or you know, I had to have something like this happen. But it was just this going into the absolute now and the absolute wisdom of the moment and, and zero fear. So in some ways, that feels like an, that feels like a gift to have had that and to have experienced that. The other thing I think that really was a gift for me was um, as somebody who is very privileged and has had a really happy life and a lot of really good things go my way, I've had a lot of positive discrimination go my way, it was really good for me to understand the impact and prevalence of violence against women because I didn't really get it. You know how often unless you've experienced something, you don't really get it. You know, mm. you go, oh, that's terrible and all that, but it, you can empathise, but you have Don't, no real experience. No, and I just remember going, gee, why didn't that lady want to give me her phone number? That's a bit weird. You know, <laughs> then I probably go, oh, yeah, right, okay. People don't feel safe. I feel safe because I had a gorgeous childhood with parents that loved me and looked after me and I was safe. And that was my basis and I carried on and I was safe. So what happens when that's not your reality? And so that gave me such a gracious understanding that I didn't have in the past. So I, I think that's something that I feel really has enlarged me as a human being. So um, and I guess I just learned, you know, I think I think resilience is a really uh, mysterious thing mm. and uh, it's. A, I think so much of it's luck. What does resilience mean to you? I guess resilience means that, that you come through and you're okay. You may not be the same, but you're definitely okay. Whereas, you know, sometimes for people, they'll have blows that they don't come back from. Mm. Mm. If you could um, go back and have a chat with the Pip in her early 20s who just wanted to go to Europe and that was the plan and this, that and the other and has all this life in front of her, um, and give her a piece of advice, what would that be? Buy real estate. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just have that time machine, go back to that flat and leader while I was living in the oh. 80s. <laughs> Often I get really profound stuff at that point. But now I've got buy real estate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you just think, <laughs> it was only $85,000 at property. <laughs> And now it'd be it, worth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was yeah, it was interesting. I I did, <laughs> I did think that only boring people bought real estate. I guess um I guess there's something something that might have been a couple of things. I'd say um definitely go to Europe. Definitely go to Europe. But you know, yeah. I think that's that was really good. But also um 
I'd say just write. Start writing now. Don't wait till you're 50. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And uh, have you got any words that you'd like to share with the, the listeners? About? I guess, you know, I just have this one thing. I just love people to to understand about how important your health is and how important the health of your community is. And you can feel very disempowered, but we are immensely powerful beings, and especially when we come together. I like it. Mm. Fev, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you, Bryn. It's been absolutely fascinating to get an insight um, into the machinations of the health service and <laughs> and, 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 and not so much the detail, but the, the mindset behind it and, mm. and what have you. Because you're right, we don't really think about it until we need it. That's and when right. we need it, then we're in a quite a week and, yeah. Mm, exactly. In a weak spot. So, um, yeah, to actually think about that ahead of time. Mm. Uh, and, and, yeah, and then to listen to, you know, about the book and everything. It's been absolutely fascinating. So, thank you, Bruce. Thank you it's been so super much. Super fun. <laughs> <It does. laughs>